Uh, I'm, I actually am thrilled that uh, not a single person in the room got my pretest question right. So um, this is clearly a topic that uh, all of us can uh, learn from. And uh, I certainly learn a lot as I continue to read about this. We'll start with a case presentation. Uh, this is a 65-year-old white male who presented with a six-month history of a painless left neck mass. Uh, this was in the left upper neck, just below the jawline. He's a non-smoker. He's divorced but sexually active, dating. And the mass is on a, turns out to be an enlarged level two lymph node, which is uh, in the upper jugular chain. It's a palpable lymph node. He has no visible tumor in the oral cavity, pharynx, or larynx, and he's already had his tonsils removed. After examination, he was sent for a CT scan, which revealed an enlarged upper jugular chain lymph node, which measured 26 millimeters, a couple other minimally enlarged lymph nodes, and asymmetric lobulation of the, uh, of the left base of tongue, but no obvious invasive mass. Whoops. Uh, so this is what I was looking at preoperatively. You could see on the left side, it just looked a little bit different, a little bit more protuberant than the right base of tongue. This, this area, by the way, and in primary care, you would not be able to see this because this is behind the tongue as it, as it descends into the back of the throat. Uh, we did an FNA biopsy of this, and this revealed poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. But at this point, we had no known source of the, uh, uh, this is obviously a metastasis. The patient uh, was taken to surgery where he underwent a transoral resection of the, uh, what turned out to be just a tiny little stub of the tonsil that had been removed during his childhood. And I also removed the left lingual tonsil. Uh, in that specimen, the pathologist did identify a four millimeter large primary tumor within the left tonsil or remnant. The lingual tonsil was negative. The margins of that resection were widely clear. Uh, we then performed a neck dissection, and of the 31 lymph nodes evaluated, two, including the palpable mass plus a second, um, were positive for uh, squamous cell carcinoma. P16 is a protein that is produced by HPV positive tumors, so we use this as a surrogate or a marker for HPV infection. And when you see that term P16 positive, that just means HPV. Uh, and the larger mass had extra capsular extension. This is an indication for postoperative radiation therapy, at least classically, because of a uh, higher risk of, of recurrence, regional recurrence. Uh, I recommended radiation therapy as an adjuvant treatment. The patient um, really didn't want to think about the side effects of radiation, and he elected not to have any adjuvant treatment. He had some temporary spinal accessory nerve dysfunction, which resolved normal swallowing, and at two years uh, after surgery, he is without evidence of recurrence. Today, uh, I would hope everyone can take home a couple of uh, important messages. Number one, we want to learn that HPV is now the leading cause of oropharyngeal carcinoma. Uh, we want to understand that HPV infects the basal epithelial cells within the crypts of the palatine and lingual tonsils without producing any visible lesion or tumor. There is generally no significant immune response, and we want to understand the current vaccination guidelines. Historically, and this goes all the way back into the 1990s when I trained, uh, but, but you know, all of the 20th century, we think about head and neck cancer, we think about uh, older patients, typically male, generally uh, heavy smokers, they often drank as well, and, and alcohol and tobacco are synergistic carcinogens for the upper airway. Uh, and that was, our, that was our typical patient. If you trained uh, in, a, in a medical center with a VA hospital, it was just uh, rife with uh, head and neck cancer. Um, this is completely changing. So since the 1980s, there's been a more than fourfold increase in oropharyngeal carcinoma produced uh, or caused by HPV. Uh, currently, and it depends on what paper you read, but current estimates are 70 to 80 percent of all oropharyngeal carcinoma is now HPV-induced, uh, compared to 17 percent in the 1980s. Uh, 
we weren't even looking in the 1980s. So this is this 17% in this in this uh, study, which was very well conducted. The the researchers had to retrospectively pull these tumors from uh, from the archives uh, and and test them for HPV because we weren't testing back then. We were just puzzled when we'd had a, a non-smoker with throat cancer, and we would just shrug our shoulders and say, "Well, something." caused a mutation, but we couldn't figure out what. Well, that what was, was HPV, we just didn't know it. Whereas now we are routinely testing and we can see that in some series, 80% 80, 80 or more uh, cases are caused by HPV. 90% of oropharyngeal cancer uh, that's due to HPV is due to HPV-16, although there are a handful of carcinogenic uh, viruses within the HPV family. In the throat, most of it is HPV-16. And a typical HPV positive oropharyngeal cancer patient is uh, likely to be uh, male, white, and typically younger uh, than the HPV negative patients, meaning the smokers. These are often uh, men in their 50s and 60s. The good news is that the overall survival, here's our question, is significantly better, not worse, but better if your throat cancer is HPV positive. It's, there's a 70% reduced risk of dying of HPV-induced oropharyngeal cancer compared to smoking-induced oropharyngeal cancer. These patients also present differently. The typical patient with HPV-induced throat cancer presents just like the patient in the, in the case I presented. They typically have no dysphagia. They don't have pain in their throat. They have no symptoms. They just feel a firm lump in their neck that's been there for a few months or longer. Only 28% will have a sore throat. Uh, this is approximately opposite of uh, smokers, where a majority will have dysphagia or pain in their throat, and, um, and fewer will actually palpate a lymph node. If you look at the, I'm sorry, these, these are pretty small to see, but you can see the trend lines for HPV-related oropharyngeal cancer are uh, it's shooting upward and uh, at a very fast pace, whereas cervical cancer here, HPV-induced cervical cancer, is declining. And um, uh, it is expected within the next few years that HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer will be the majority of all head and neck cancer in the U.S. In fact, HPV cancer, as you can, HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer has now passed HPV-positive cervical cancer in the U.S. and Europe. So this is, this is uh, truly an epidemic and a uh, major paradigm shift in thinking about HPV-related disease. In this study, the authors uh, randomly uh, selected patients literally off the street uh, and asked them to rinse their mouth and spit and they were looking for the presence of human papillomavirus in the oral secretions. 7% of a non-selected uh, group of adults in the United States are carrying HPV in their, in their mouth or throat. 10% in men and 4% in women. And of this group with no symptoms, 1% is actually carrying HPV-16. Uh, the positivity is associated with other measures of sexual activity as well independently of tobacco use. And they concluded, and, and there's other evidence as well, but in this study they concluded that HPV oral infection is predominantly sexually transmitted rather than through casual contact, including kissing. The virus itself is a DNA virus. Uh, there, are, there are over 200 papillomaviruses which have been identified. 150 or more are human papillomavirus. They're relatively small viruses. They're double-stranded DNA viruses. And all of the papillomaviruses share a non-enveloped uh, icosahedral structure, which is about 50 to 60 nanometers in diameter, so very, very small. And the genome is a double-stranded uh, circle of DNA with about 8,000 base pairs. Within the HPV genome, uh, there are uh, a series of genes that are classified into early and late genes, E1 through 7 and L1 and L2. The papillomavirus has to survive uh, within the human cells, and they maintain their genomes in an extra 
extra chromosomal episome that tethers to the host DNA. It's not actually inserted directly into the host DNA. E2, or early, early 2, plays the major role in establishing persistent viral infection by tethering the viral DNA to the host DNA during cell replication. And these interactions between the e E2 and host protein may provide targets for new treatments to help clear persistent infections so that the virus cannot tether to the uh, human uh, DNA. The actual oncogenicity uh, is attributed to the, the so-called immortalizing transforming properties of HPV oncoproteins E6 and E7. Uh, these oncoproteins serve multiple functions, but one of their major functions is to inactivate tumor suppression proteins P53 and retinoblastoma protein, which leads to a loss of both cell cycle and DNA damage control. The P53 protein when, with human papillomavirus infection is inactivated, it's not mutated. And this is an important distinction because it can be reactivated during treatment such as chemotherapy or radiation, which then allows the P53 protein to reduce tumor survival. And this is different from tobacco and alcohol induced squamous muscle carcinoma, which actually cause a mutation within the P53 gene. And this may and probably does explain the significantly in better prognosis with treatment for HPV-related throat cancer. HPV is able to do this because it can essentially remain undetected in the body for many, many years, including decades, uh, by replicating itself at fairly low levels within the basal epithelium at the bottom of those crypts in the tonsils uh, to maintain itself in the host, but essentially uh, undetected by the immune system. Later in its infectious cycle, the virus begins to replicate uh, in much higher levels, and this occurs in the outer or upper epidermal layers uh, of the mucosa, which are must, much less observed by the host immune system. And uh, smoking and alcohol appear to be additional risk factors which can increase the likelihood of persistent infection. The role of genetics has been looked at, and so far there have been no convincing genes or HLA haplotypes that are associated with persistent HPV infection. Something interesting uh, about HPV that I learned is that anogenital human papillomavirus is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. About 70 million cases total and about 14 million new cases a year. There's actually two peaks, uh, two peak periods of prevalence of, of this infection. Uh, individuals less than 30, and again, uh, 55 to 64. And about half of all of the infections occur in females between the ages of 15 and 24. Most of the infections, probably close to 90% of infections, are cleared by the immune system. Uh, and as we just talked about, some of these infections are able to avoid detection by the innate immune response and remain active for many, many years. These are intra-epithelial infections. They don't produce viremia, cell lysis, or cell death, which allows them to lie undetected. Additionally, the virus replication is not associated with inflammation, and so pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as type 1 interferons, are not released. The uh, antigen-presenting cells, which are Langerhans cells and dendritic cells that Dr. Rubin talked about, um, are lacking the signals for activation, migration, and recruitment. And the infected cells produce viral, viral particles which are shed away from the basal epithelium. They're shed in, uh, away on the surface into the throat, but away from the circulating immune cells. And the viral proteins are not presented on the infected epithelial cell surface so that uh, the, the antigen-presenting cells don't get to sample them. Uh, and this immune tolerance, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, due to some other features, can result in persistent infection. And as I said, there's no clear link to uh, specific HLA types. Within the throat, uh, HPV does not infect uh, the mucosa uh, throughout the throat. It specifically infects the tonsils. The palatine tonsils, which of course are the tonsils at the back of the throat that you can see, as well as the lingual tonsil that most people don't know they have, but exists on the backside of the tongue. So tongue-based cancer is generally cancer of 
the lingual tonsil. Uh, within the tonsils, especially deep within the crypts, there's a discontinuous basement membrane, and there are these deep invaginations. And those deep invaginations explain why these tumors, which are different from the smoking-induced tumors, are generally not visible. The, the smoking-induced oropharyngeal cancers are typically uh, more readily seen early on because they tend to occur on the surface, whereas th these infections are deep within the crypts, and therefore a small tumor, like the patient we just mentioned, generally does not have a, uh, a visible tumor. Uh, and the lymphoid tissue, which is uh, associated with the, these crypts, may allow tumors to evade the immune surveillance due to lymphoepithelial cell expression of something called programmed death ligand 1, or PDL1, which suppresses T cell responses to HPV. Unlike cervical cancer, where uh, there is screening for cervical uh, dysplasia, CIN 1 through 3, there is no precursor lesion within the pharynx to screen for. There's nothing to swab uh, or see. And so far, no one has identified that multi-step process of increasing dysplasia. Uh, there is a male to female ratio of approximately four to one. And there are theories as to why this is the case. There may be a higher prevalence of oral HPV-16 infection within the throat, or possibly reduced seroconversion after genital HPV disease. Additionally, there is possibly a higher female to male transmissibility of HPV with oral sex due to higher vaginal and cervical HPV copy numbers. Finally, uh, and this, is a, this is a question that is often asked um, by spouses, that partners of HPV, uh, partners of patients with HPV-induced oropharyngeal cancer do not have more frequent oral HPV infections. And this suggests a relatively low risk of oral to oral transmission. So, we have a disease that is on the rise, it's an epidemic, it's an infection, we should be screening. Well, we can't, because there's nothing to screen for, there's nothing to brush. I've had already in the past couple of years, a number of patients come in uh, because they've read about this, or maybe they have a spouse that's had cervical dysplasia, and they would like to be screened for, for throat cancer. And of course, we can look for throat cancer, but we can't look for progressive dysplasia in the throat. And if they have a normal exam, which they always do since they're, they don't have cancer at this point, um, there's really no valuable information by examining them. But they are worried about it. Let's talk about vaccination. Gardasil 9 is a nine-valent vaccine targeting 6 and 11. 6 and 11 cause benign uh, uh, lesions, benign papilloma of the, the genitals as well as the oropharynx, and then it vaccinates against 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. These are all oncogenic viruses. Uh, the good news is they are expecting this to significantly reduce the incidence of HPV-positive oropharyngeal cancer, but only after 2060, when I'm pretty sure we're all going to be retired, and some of us may be dead. Um, but Yes, but eventually, oropharyngeal cancer, like cervical cancer, will, will go into decline, just not in our careers. And in fact, if you look at those curves that I showed earlier, this is only going to continue to rise for the rest of our careers. Current CDC guidelines recommend vaccination routinely for all boys and girls at the age of 11 or 12, two doses now rather than three, which had been recommended previously. Um, if the child is 15 or older at the time of, of immunization, they recommend three doses. And interestingly, after I put my talk together, uh, just about two weeks ago, the FDA actually changed the approval. It is now approved up to the age of 45 for both men and women. However, the CDC has not yet changed their recommendation. In fact, I just checked Thursday night to see if the CDC had revised their recommendations based on the <coughs> FDA approval, and they haven't yet, but I, I, I would think that they would. But currently, the CDC is recommending vaccination through the age of 26 for females, 21 for males, unless the males have sex with other men or have a variety of immunodeficient states. 
contraindicated during pregnancy, or if you're allergic to the uh, vaccine or its components. And of course, you can check this. Uh, I've checked you know, several times now, but this is the CDC has, um, has a, a section of their website where you can view their current uh, recommendations. Well, it's an infection. One would think that we could devise uh, immunotherapies to fight the cancer. We've talked about vaccination, which will prevent the cancer, but if you already have the cancer, it would be nice to enlist the, uh, the immune system to help fight the cancer. And this forms the basis for therapeutic vaccines as well as uh, immunomodulatory drugs. One strategy was, would be to have uh, to bolster or improve the HPV T cell adaptive immunity. And this can be done, there's, there are several potential strategies here. These are very broad things that, that you see here. We can try to prime the native T cells from the patient to, immune, to produce cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which target the HPV infected cells. We'd like to generate CD4 positive T cells to produce the necessary cytokines to activate the appropriate inflammatory pathways. And we'd like to strengthen the ability of antigen presenting cells to present those antigens to the immune system to help destroy the tumor. Humoral therapies are also being uh, investigated in terms of vaccination. Um, both intradermal as well as intramuscular vaccines have been uh, uh, investigated. Uh, the, the intramuscular vaccine injects the, the, uh, uh, the vaccine into the myocyte, which then expresses the antigen encoded by the DNA. That's engulfed by dendritic cells and expressed on MHC, MHC complexes. And then the MHC complexes are presented to CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. Uh, so far, by themselves, DNA and protein-based vaccines have failed to generate a significant initial humo, uh, immune response. Possibly, adjuvants such as imiquimod or sidafovir may be necessary to improve or increase the immune response. Um, possibly live vaccination strategies in the future to uh, engineer uh, an attenuated live virus to express that E2 uh, gene which, remember, helps attach the uh, viral DNA to the human DNA uh, as an intralesional therapy is being investigated. Dendritic whole cell-based vaccines have been investigated, and these are patient-derived monocytes, which are cultured in the lab into mature dendritic cells, stimulated with appropriate viral antigen, and then reintroduced into the patient to stimulate both humoral and cellular immune response. None of these so far has, has demonstrated enough improvement to be uh, a clinical option. Immunotherapy, um, sorry, uh, other FDA approved treatments uh, that are possibly coming in the future include um, uh, immunomodulatory drugs. Nivolumab is a PD1 program death inhibitor. And again, this blocks that interaction between the PDL1 on the cancer cell with PD1 on the T cell to prevent the cancer from uh, from evading the immune response. And cytoximab is an epidermal growth factor receptor being investigated in clinical trials, not just for oral pharyngeal cancer, but you see this in other solid cancers as well. Um, we've talked about the fact that, that HPV-induced oral pharyngeal cancer carries a significantly better prognosis than smoking-induced cancer. And most of these patients live now. Uh, this, this is a cancer for most people that has an 80 to 90 percent survival rate, even for patients who present with, uh, with cervical lymphadenopathy, which was not true for smoking-induced um, oral pharyngeal cancer. And so the question is, can we begin to reduce the aggressiveness of our treatment to match the, the less aggressive nature of this cancer? Because the treatments also have significant long-term morbidity, and, the, and these patients are going to survive and live a long time and often with permanent side effects of treatment. So there's a number of areas that are being investigated in terms of potentially reduced, um, uh, reduced radiation dosages in, in these patients who are receiving either post-operative or chemo radiation as, as their initial treatment, um, as well as radiating uh, less tissue in the neck uh, for some of these patients. Um, and, and potentially, uh, more patients who receive single therapy, surgery only, 
uh, or radiation only as a form of treatment rather than combination treatment. And that's it. Yes, go ahead. You talked about the synergistic carcinogen smoking and alcohol. What about vaping and smokeless, like chewing tobacco? Or does that cross right over into those risks as well? Um, certainly, chewing tobacco is associated with all of the oral and pharyngeal cancers. And so absolutely, that would be a significant risk factor. I have not seen any data about vaping. <laughs>